I'm a brand new amateur radio enthusiast. I have had my ticket uh, since 2008. Uh, the night I took my test, I took all three. Uh, I've, I've been an engineer for like 35 years, so I work over here at uh, Northrop Grumman, and we build airborne radar. I'm a digital type guy, digital engineering, uh, digital electric. So, uh, uh, I and a couple other engineers were uh, talking about starting up a, a robotics society, and uh, we uh, uh, broached it with uh, the uh, Museum of Bridgeport there, the uh, Discovery Museum, and they were quite interested. They had a number of projects they might like us to work on, and uh, so we said, that sounds interesting, and uh, we started talking about, uh, you know, just kicking back and forth to some projects. And uh, this is the one we, we settled on for, the, for our first effort. It, uh, we're, uh, <coughs> our goal is to send cameras to the edge of space. We're going to send back uh, uh, television, uh, color television, and uh, uh, position reports and telemetry. Uh, then we hope to recover the hardware. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's about a thousand bucks of stuff in, in the balloon, so uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, if we recover the hardware, the next, uh, the next launch is only two, three hundred bucks. But uh, uh, this is something that uh, the museum, uh, they were thinking, well, gee, you know, we can get on the front page of the Connecticut Post, maybe with a picture, that'd be worth about half a million dollars if, uh, <laughs> you know. Anyway, uh, they, they uh, found a, uh, uh, a volunteer to, uh, a very nice man, to, uh, to, uh, um, to fund, the, uh, fund the enterprise. And uh, he put up about uh, $9,000. And uh, off we started. And uh, this is the story of our adventure. Uh, we uh, start with a project description. And uh, uh, this presentation was used in several ways. So uh, one, uh, one particular uh, aspect of it was that uh, we were uh, giving progress reports. So. Uh, we, uh, we talk about uh, parts acquisition and development progress and where we are. And I've got some photos and we've got a little movie and uh, test plan. That's uh, where we're headed. Here's the, here's the beast. Uh, it's not drawn to scale. Uh, the balloon, we think, will be about uh, 16 uh, feet in diameter on the ground. Uh, but it will be much, much larger than that up above. Uh, we will have a payload cut down, command detach. We'll be able to exercise from the ground. And a 10 foot diameter parachute, depending on the final weight of the uh, electronics apparatus. That is bright, boy, oh boy. Um, and uh, we have uh, a radar reflector as a requirement. Uh, we have a VHF antenna, electronics package, a camera window, and uh, a UHF and beetle antenna underneath, which is going to send us uh, circularly polarized uh, stuff. So here we go. Um, can everybody see this? It might be pretty small from the back. If you move the tables up, it can uh, I, I can talk to it. Okay. We have uh, this section over here is the video section. We're going to, we have a 525 line color television camera and we have mounted this on a gyro stabilized platform. Um, we uh, uh, have a microprocessor and uh, it's over here and we're going to be uh, uh, using uh, servos to control the position of the, in, in three axes of the camera. So we have uh, pitch, roll and yaw. And uh, overlaid on top of the video is uh, the GPS coordinates, the uh, uh, 
the speed and the course of the balloon, the uh, distance and direction to launch point, the time, the date, and the call sign. I'll show you that in a, in a minute. Um, so we have a GPS-4 from a, uh, an outfit called Bionics. Uh, the GPS-4 is altitude enabled. Most GPSs um, die at 60,000 feet. They won't process anything above that altitude. Uh, so you have to go get a special one which can go higher. Um, they don't want these being used as, uh, you know, uh, command uh, and control for a, a, a ICBM built by the terrorists or, or anything. So um, this one uh, will uh, will die if uh, if it's up that high and the speed gets over about 700 miles an hour, which is unlikely in our case. So we're we're good to go. And down here we have something we got on, on uh, ham TV, VM70X. It's a 5 watt UHF transmitter. And it will be transmitting uh, the, uh, at uh, uh, 432 megahertz, which is cable channel 59. Now, over on the other side, we have a totally different GPS, uh, same, same type. And we're talking to a little tiny track four. How many of you have heard of, uh, uh, of it? this? Is an APRS device, and uh, uh, it's 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 pretty interesting because it not only will um, take the GPS data uh, coming in NEMA NM0183 format and translate it to uh, APRS, but it will also allow a microprocessor to send. Uh, a group of ASCII text followed by a carriage return, and it will packet that up and burst it out. So um, we can we have bidirectional trans uh, communications with the ground via the VHF, and then we are receiving the uh, UHF uh, as a you know as television. All right, and the microprocessor controls the. Uh, uh, position of the camera and uh, works with several of the vehicle sensors and uh, we also have some telemetry sensors that are tied right straight into the tiny track. There will be some version of standalone still camera and some version of local recording also. <coughs> local recording of course you can't pick it up if you don't recover the bird. Mm. The telemetry section, we're going to be, I'm actually going to be working the design of this board this weekend. We have three LM180 and 135s to monitor outside temperature, transmitter temperature, and inside temperature. We're going to monitor the temperature inside the, uh, the uh, uh, container. And battery voltage and outside pressure. And outside pressure, we have to scale it. Um, because well, outside it's 1,100 <coughs> millibars, and up where we're going, it's one millibar. So uh, you, you, the A to D uh, range in here is uh, uh, 999 steps. So mm -hmm. up at one millibar, you have one step right. left. Mm -hmm. So we have to we'll have to scale that up by 10 so that we get a little uh, uh, resolution up there. Um, we have data, serial data, to and from the microprocessor going in uh, through the radio <coughs> interface down here to the, to the uh, radio, and we have data coming back going uh, to the microprocessor. And uh, um, so that's it. In the vehicle control section, we have a microprocessor of the Ar uh, Arduino variety. Um, and uh, we have a three-axis gyroscope tied in. We have a three-axis electronic compass and a three-axis accelerometer. And with those, we are able to, and I have a movie that shows this later on, uh, we are able to 
swing and spin the container on the end of the rope and uh, the TV camera looks in the same position and it can correct an azimuth elevation and yaw there, uh, pitch roll and yaw rather. So um, this is a fun project. We've, we've been working on it a while here now and we're, we're, it's, we're into it. Um, so, uh, we control the video camera platform and we control other interfaces as well. Um, uh, transmit level uh, from the UHF transmitter. The thing gets hot. It transmits 5 watts, but it dissipates 20. <coughs> and so it's cooking. And we have to take the heat out of that. And that's going to be a trick. Um, and. Uh, uh, we, we do have the ability from the ground to be able to adjust. We turn a pot on the ground and the transmit RF goes up and down. So we can turn it down to half a watt or turn it up to five. What frequency do you go up on to control it? Um, well, we're picking a frequency which is um, uh, in the experimental area. Okay. And... Uh, uh, we're probably using uh, a, a PL as well, uh, so that uh, we have the best shot at uh, not not being interfered with. Um, but we're going to, um, uh, at, but on the way down, the the downlink is 144.390, which is the standard APRS frequency, and we're careful with what we are going to put out on that line. We don't want to just jam the channel with lots of data, okay? Uh, so we're going to send uh, uh, position reports every minute and a uh, telemetry report every minute. And every once in a while, status updates and additional telemetry. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're going to try and not flood it, okay? Uh, the benefit uh, that we get out of using the standard channel is that there's 15 or 20 stations listening to it in the, in the greater uh, area of Long Island Sound. Um, and I imagine we'll get heard, you know, far away as Boston maybe, okay? Um, at least while we're up high. Uh, so uh, that's the benefit. Uh, and then we're, you're, anybody with a, uh, with a, a computer is going to be able to go to APRS.FI and you'll be able to w watch the balloon and track it on uh, uh, Google Maps. Mm. So anybody with uh, internet access can watch it. Ah, here is our scheme and we, we didn't, uh, we were, we were worried about uh, whether the electronics was going to play at altitude. Um, and uh, here's our stab at, uh, at doing that. We're going to build the chamber, the uh, electronics package. We're going to make ourselves a uh, composite package. This is a new slide. You haven't seen this one, uh, Bill. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, this was only the, the result of the last couple weeks, okay? The, we're in the early stages of the design of the gondola at this moment. And uh, uh, we're going to use a composite. We're going to uh, use half inch, uh, three quarter inch, uh, 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 the, the styrofoam stuff they put on the, the pink stuff that they put on the side of the houses. Uh, what do you mean? It, yeah, it's styrofoam insulation. insulation. Styrofoam insulation. Styrofoam insulation. And, then we're going to fiberglass that on both sides. And we're going to make a, a sealed container. So we have a sealed container around the whole thing. Now there's a couple, uh, we're going to have a, a hatch for access so we can get in and out and charge the batteries and stuff. And then the, uh, the gondola wall is going to have uh, a, a CO2 fill valve on the bottom. It's going to have uh, some dual pressure relief valves so that if we get uh, more than 10 PSI above atmospheric pressure, 
the uh, uh, it, the atmosphere, the CO2 will will uh, come out, you know, leak out. Uh, but this is uh, a relief valve. It'll stop leaking out at uh, 10 psi uh, delta. Uh, now we're going to use uh, dry ice in a uh, chamber inside at 45 to 60 psi as the method to both provide the cooling and also to keep the uh, to pressure chamber at, uh, at the right pressure. Now, uh, we may actually move this and bring two heat sinks in contact, but here's the UHF transmitter down below. It gets hot. The heat's got a heat sink. We'll call that the hot heat sink right here, and it's got a fan on it. Then we have the uh, cold heat sink on the bottom of the dry ice chamber. And we have a fan on that one as well. And we're going to blow this fan hard enough to keep the temperature of the heat sink nominal so that the electronics doesn't heat up too much. That's going to generate heat inside the container. And we're going to sense that with the temperature sensor. And uh, we're going to blow harder on the uh, uh, dry ice. Uh, on the cold heat sink, if we want to cool it down. Yes. What's the outside air temperature at 100,000 feet? Uh, what there is of the air at um, outside right here, there's uh, 1,100 millibars right. of atmosphere. At 100,000 feet, uh, there is one millibar. Right, but what's the temperature? The temperature drops down to. Minus 40 to minus 50 uh, in the 60, 70,000 foot range and actually rises back to about minus 40 at 100,000 feet. And is that, I mean, I'm curious as to why you wouldn't put the heat sink on the outside and just dissipate the heat outside. Is it too cold to do that? Uh, we can, but we need a way, you know, we, we want to be able to heat the thing. We don't want it to, uh, you know. You need to be able to control it. If you fed yeah. it to the outside, you wouldn't be able to control it. Yeah. Yeah. How long will the dry ice last? And how long do you anticipate to be aloft? Um, Mike uh, has worked the calculations, and uh, we think the dry ice will last. Uh, uh, a three by three by three uh, <coughs> block of dry ice uh, will release an incredible amount of gas. Many many cubic feet as it uh, and uh, as it uh, uh, sublimates, it will uh, take a lot of heat with it too. So this is our experiment. We're going to try and regulate the temperature and the pressure at least to uh, three quarters, maybe two thirds of an atmosphere in the chamber, and uh, keep the temperature warm. Actually. We want the thing to be 80, 85 degrees in, inside so that as we rise up around 30, 40,000 feet, we don't get uh, condensation on the outside of the window. That's the idea. So those fans will be blowing around uh, uh, on the window that's on the bottom of the thing as well. Here's what the video section looks like. Um, yeah, this is uh, taken from the internet. This uh, uh, before we purchased the, uh, the this slide it was taken from the internet before we purchased the thing. I have an another slide that shows uh, ours working, um, but it shows the, the uh, latitude and longitude, and you know, the the course and speed, and the altitude. That's the GPS altitude now. And this is uh, uh, the distance and direction to launch point. This is the time, this is the date, and that's the call sign. So that we're legal. How large an image would you have from 100,000 feet? This is a 525 line television. Yeah, but you're 100,000 feet up. Yeah. How large an image will you? We will see the, the, we will see the blackness of space and the curvature of the earth from up there. Mm. Mm. 
and uh, so we're psyched. Now down on the ground, we have to control it all. And to that end, we have purchased a Yesu as L mount and uh, two long M squared antennas um, that are one's UHF and one's VHF. They're circularly polarized, so they have both vertical and horizontal elements. And uh, uh, the UHF guy's got about 30 elements, and this guy's got about 15 or something like that. So uh, they're, they're about 10 feet long. <coughs> and, uh, and it's not less, it's less than 15. Uh, but probably seven and, and uh, you know, 15 if you count the horizontal ones. But each of these is about 10 foot long, and uh, the other weekend we built those, and uh, they're over at the museum now. They're waiting in the garage for us to, uh, to uh, we need to galvanize the pole that's going to hold this whole thing up, and we have uh, uh, an anchor that's built that needs to be galvanized. It's going to anchor it to the wall uh, of the top section of the, and of the antenna up there, of the uh, roof. So there's also a control panel, which will have two joysticks and a couple of pots to control the, uh, to do manual control of the azimuth and elevation of this antenna, uh, and to do, um, uh, one pot will control the, uh, the RF uh, at, the, uh, at the balloon, and uh, the other pot will uh, control the well, you have azimuth and elevation and roll uh, on the camera that's in the balloon. So we'll be able to steer from the ground the camera in the balloon, and when we take our hand off the joystick, it will stay pointed at that spot. So you're not going to have a computer uh, tracking the unit? Yes, we are. The data that comes in from the VHF every minute goes into this PC, and the PC knows where the antenna is, and it knows where the balloon is, so it figures the azimuth and the elevation, and steers this antenna. Okay, so you don't have to manually control it. Right. Okay. But you can. You can flip it to manual, and zzz. we thought maybe mm, if we had a uh, a little camera we could stick up there, then you know, a little crosshair if you could. <laughs> you can steer the thing, you know, from the control station. Um, but we do get, uh, you know, we do get elevation and uh, uh, azimuth on the meter, so you know we can read what it's what it is. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a TS two thousand uh, HF uh, and uh, VHF radio and uh, the rotor interface. So that's the ground station. And there's one side of this will be the video where we will uh, uh, be looking at the video from space. And the other side is the data side where we're going to be controlling the balloon and looking at the uh, telemetry data from the balloon. And it, it will come down the VHF channel, be received by the PC, and displayed on the data screen. Now we're going to repeat the video out to the to the uh, the general, uh, uh, they have a uh, uh, like an auditorium, and we're going to go put that on the big screen, and uh, the uh, data screen will be on a large screen TV that's up to the right, mm -hmm. so we'll be able to they'll be able to read the uh, the values of the, and we'll be able to control the temperatures and other things. Uh, we've modified this slightly. I haven't updated the slide. Uh, we've really got these three incorporated as one, one control station for the uh, for the antenna and the uh, and the uh, uh, the balloon. And uh, we want to have an amateur radio liaison position. We want to have and chase vehicle control. These may be combined. And uh, uh, we want to uh, then we have to do recording and distribution for, for the public viewing. So this is a big effort. And uh, the museum's supposed to help us out with that. 
So uh, we'll see how that comes along. How many people are actually involved in that? So far, three. That's it. <laughs> Myself and uh, uh, Mike Mitzikevich, and our names are down here, and uh, Eric Klaus. Are you looking for volunteers to assist with it? Absolutely. Or? Absolutely. Especially as we get closer to launch day. I did. He's a shill in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and when is the when, sorry? When is the launch date? Oh, uh, we're targeting August. August. Yep. But we have driven a stake in the ground, and we're going to do a tethered launch at 90 Acres Park, just north of the museum, with as much of the electronics as we can put together, which will be the TV camera. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have all the balloon electronics, except that we won't have all the software yet for the balloon cut down and the, the other stuff. Uh, we won't have all the software written, but um, we're hoping that we're, we will launch April 1st, so one month from today. That's a tall order, so we got to get there. And uh, we're going to be, that's, we will have the antenna up on the roof by then. And uh, uh, we're going to be, uh, you know, we'll, hopefully we'll be able to, at the next show, we'll see uh, footage of the, you know, Discovery Museum from uh, 500 feet. All right. At, for chase vehicles, we're going to need uh, one or two boats uh, and a car. We're going to station uh, where the balloon is likely to touch down. Uh, we want to... Uh, GPS and VHF, UHF radio, and uh, cell phone for backup, and we would really like to have APRS in the chase vehicle so that we can see where they are. Um, we hope the amateur radio community will take an active interest in the project and expect to recruit some chase vehicle support and some other support there. How many of you have, uh, have done uh, any amateur uh, television, for example? You have. Okay. With the well, old Robert uh, system. If you point your antenna up in the sky on that day and uh, tune to that frequency, you'll be able to get the video directly and the data that's on top of it. How far are you expecting it to go? You're not going to let it. You're gonna, it sounds like you're going to drop it here. There's another to... shill I have in there. <laughs> that's my next slide. <laughs> it, ter it turns out that uh, the University of Wyoming has this balloon trajectory oh service, goodness. okay? These guys in Wyoming, they're the ones that compile for the FAA the winds aloft for the entire country, okay? Well, so, blame them. That's where it comes from. Hundreds and hundreds of weather balloons they send up with radio songs in them every day. And uh, most of them are not recovered. They just let them go. Um, but, uh, uh, they have a service and they let us use it, okay? Which uh, we just specify the launch point here and we specify the vertical rate of rise, which is gonna be a thousand feet per, per minute and the exact time of launch. And this has to be like the day of, you know, uh, to be accurate. Um, and they will, and what's the burst altitude? 100,000 feet. And they will give you, they will show you the, pra the trajectory and the projected impact point. And this is, uh, we have two days that are shown here. One day we launched at Bridgeport and we landed here just northwest of Riverhead. And uh, another day we launched at Bridgeport, same deal. We burst it up here and we are just across from Northport and uh, Norwalk. Mm. So we could very well be coming this way. So, um, oh my, this is uh, the detail. I won't bore you with the whole thing. This is all the stuff we bought. But that uh, TS-2000 rig is uh, right up top. That's, that's going to be a sweet machine. They will be able to use this equipment to, um, to talk to uh, Arisat uh, and the satellites and also the International Space Station. 
and that, uh, that thrills them because they want to bring their students in and, you know, that sort of a thing. Just out of curiosity, why did you buy a 2000 rather than something geared strictly to VHF, UHF? Well, the 2000 is full duplex. It has a satellite mode where you can listen to yourself as you talk. And you are, your uplink is on VHF, your downlink on UHF, or vice versa, okay? And as you, as you, you put it in a certain mode, and as you adjust the tuning for Doppler, uh, to, to make yourself hear right, to hear yourself right, you're adjusting the transmit in one direction and the receive in the other direction. You know, when the, when the, uh, if you have a satellite coming up over the, over the horizon coming at you, um, and you want to transmit to it, you have to transmit low so that when it hits the satellite and, and, and gains in frequency with Doppler, it'll be at the frequency the satellite's tuned to because he doesn't know where you are. And uh, so you have to tune the transmitter low, but the receiver, you have to tune that high because when you're receiving him, all right, it's gonna get the Doppler, it's gonna be like a train whistle. Oh. So, but the transmit goes like this and the receive goes like this. So you have to set those memories up in advance, you know, and, and tune it. And this, this device has a, uh, a way to do it all in one, which is cool. Mm -hmm. So, plus if they want to do HF work, they've got the machine. You know, so they can do just about anything they want to do with radio, you know, and have a nice uh, integrated, uh, computer-driven, they can track the satellites with ham radio deluxe, and the antenna will go <laughs> So. All right, our development. Uh, the video section is fully operational in the lab. Telemetry section is uh, breadboarded. We have uh, one temperature sensor. We've got to design the rest of that and get it working in the next couple weeks. Um, the GPS APRS radio modem is fully functional, and we've transmitted both uh, telemetry and position reports from the balloon. The ve vehicle control section, the microprocessor can accept commands over the radio, and it can position the TV in three axes. Uh, and uh, uh, it, the microprocessor can control the TV in three axes as you swing the as you swing in and spin the platform. And we started out with just an accelerometer, and we couldn't do that. Um, and so we had to bring a gyroscope in. Um, I, I'll, t I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. Um, ground equipment. Antennas are assembled in early February. They're ready to mount. The rotor's running in the lab. The antenna mount is purchased. The construction's completed. We have to galvanize the pieces. That is happening Monday. Uh, the mast is purchased, and it's also going to be galvanized Monday. The radio room has been selected. The ex we have excellent access to the roof for cabling. I'm going uh, to the museum Saturday, and I'm going to be measuring for uh, antenna cable and purchasing the antenna cable. Um, we, uh, uh, control station that was acquired, we have a computer acquired from Dave Mestre. It's got a bunch of serial ports on it, which we need. And uh, uh, it's working in the lab. There's a video monitor from Eric Klaus. Te uh, television, uh, lab TV purchased by Mike Mitzikevich. Uh, control panel, uh, we're very beginning stages of that. Right now, we're doing all of our input by computer to control the balloon. And uh, we really do need, uh, you know, uh, the physical controls. And a little, uh, probably a little Arduino or some microprocessor there to help us uh, with the man-machine interface. Um, 
So RS-232 distribution and display and video distribution and display. They were not originally part of the balloon project budget, so we have to figure that out as we go here. We can control the antenna rotor. We can receive and parse ASRF, A, uh, sorry, APRS data now. We can control the balloon TV camera remotely via radio across the lab. And we've worked out the equations for converting latitude, and longitude, and altitude to steer the antenna to go to where the balloon is. Uh, we're waiting on uh, uh, the, the finish of the balloon design so we can complete the command set from the ground. All right. Now we have pictures of this all, okay? Here is a TV camera right here. And uh, this is a block of wood, okay? <laughs> but the TV camera has since been placed in there. And that is what the TV camera lo uh, looks like. And it is in there now. Uh, and we have a, a, a uh, we have three, uh, uh, all I can think of is solenoids. Three, three servos, sorry, thank you. Ha. Three servos for uh, pitch, roll, and yaw to, to control it. And you'll see a movie uh, later. We have a little movie of that. Uh, here's our control station. Here's the TS-2000 and the uh, control station for the, uh, this is a power supply, and that's the control station for the, uh, uh, antenna uh, for the ASL mount. Uh, and here's the computer and the dis display. Uh, a little bit closer view. Here we see the tiny track 4 radio modem. And this is what the telemetry looks like. I'm sorry if you can't quite read that from back there. I'll read one to you. K1MJM-5. That's uh, my friend Mike's call sign. Um, and uh, APTT4 wide 1 1, wide 2 1 is the path, the APRS path. Um, and now we have the time and the latitude, the longitude, the word balloon, and uh, uh, the date and the altitude. Okay? All in ASCII text. And this is the thing that keys the radio, the VHF radio, and uh, puts out the packet data. Here's the ASL rotator, and it's controlled by the computer application. That's a beautiful thing. I, you know, it's, it's, that's sweet. Here's the radar reflector. You need one of those. And this is the little GPS-4, Bionics uh, GPS. Uh, here's the TV camera, the real one. And uh, here is the, let's see, this section here is the video overlay board. This is the little power supply. It's just breadboarded at this point, but now it's put on a real circuit board. And uh, uh, this is the uh, VHF transmitter. I'm sorry, UHF transmitter. There's a better picture of that later. Here's the two batteries. We're going to use, well, we'll probably use three. Uh, three batteries. Uh, these are 7.4 uh, volt or um, uh, RC batteries, radio control batteries. Uh, they are uh, LiPo batteries, lithium polymer. And uh, they've got uh, an incredible amount of uh, uh, juice in them. Uh, for their weight. Here's a close-up, and if you see here, it's, uh, I was wrong, 434 megahertz, cable channel 59. And that's the thing that gets hot right there. It transmits 5 watts, it dissipates about 20. Now here is a picture um, sent by radio across the t uh, across the lab to a television on the other side of the lab, and the camera is looking at the uh, uh, receiving station. So here's the latitude, here's the speed, and the uh, 
uh, altitude and uh, time and date and call sign. And this is the little wheel, the UHF the antenna we're going to use for UHF. Um, a lot of, uh, of the balloonists and uh, other folks uh, have used this type of antenna to great effect, so that's why we chose it. Now, will that be inside or outside of the This will, it, it, will be, it will be hanging down underneath the, uh, below underneath the beast, below it. And there may be a little screen up above that for reflecting. And uh, as such, if you have a water landing, the microprocessor got to know that you're coming down so it can turn off the, turn off the transmitter, because you don't want to go underwater with the antenna while you're transmitting five watts. Um, so we, we have to shut it off. Here are the two antennas that we've, uh, that we've purchased and built and are now at the museum waiting to get mounted. This is a, uh, um, a two meter and a, a, the 440. Okay. What, what's our plan? Um, we'll come right down here to galvanize mass and supports, and that's about where we are now. Acquire a container for makeshift gondola and plan its layout. We're going to have, we're targeting, and this is, this is tight. We're targeting a uh, um, tethered launch at 90 acres April 1st. The museum has a great big space day, and we're going to try and we're going to try and uh, be there with a the presence. And we're going to, but in order to do that, we're going to have to do our launch the day before. So the, uh, you know, because yeah, when you got a lot of kids and everybody else and the parents around, it's not the time to be working out your engineering problems. Um, if you have to look at scopes or find out, oh, you forgot to turn on the power to the video lamp and that's why you don't have the signal and you know all that stuff you, you can't do that with a big audience so uh, I think our plan right now is to is to is to be there the day before Saturday and uh, uh, send it up and test it and then we'll just send it up again Sunday and then we can you know do the show and tell then because but, uh, it's tethered, you're going to crank it down rather than use a uh, yes. a uh, an parachute. Issue. Yes. Um, we uh, have 80 pound test fishing line, and that's uh, be very light, and it, it'll it'll hold up 500 feet of that. You know, the balloon will. You try to go with a rope, you get 100 feet, and then, and then you run out of lift. You know, yeah. It's so, uh, uh, I mean, we'll, but the 80-pound test should be more than enough. We we'll just crank it down. Uh, let's can you see. reduce the pressure in the balloon as you're coming down? Can you reduce the pressure so it won't be as much pressure pulling up? No, the balloon is closed. Once you fill it, you you fill it to a, a specific nozzle. Um, nozzle um, uh, nozzle force where you're, it's not, it's pulling up with a certain amount of pounds, okay, and uh, uh, that's what you use if you want it to burst at a hundred thousand feet. But if you just want to send it up five hundred feet, we're going to get a smaller balloon. It won't be the same one that we're going to use for the, for oh, the okay. Um Let's see, uh, we have, uh, we're gonna check the TV and the APRS rep reception, um, and we'd love to have some help with that April, uh, the day before April 1st.